Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we have a special treat for all skiing enthusiasts out there. Following the success of our first interview, we're diving deeper into the world of expert skiing with none other than the renowned skiing guru and master coach, Harold Harb. In today's conversation, we're going to explore the origins of Harold's alternative approach to ski teaching. Harold didn't just stumble upon his unique methods. He developed them by working closely with thousands of elite skiers and racers. Problem solving for top athletes on a daily basis is what shaped Harold's understanding of skiing in ways that few can comprehend. Buckle up as Harold takes us on a journey through his experiences, sharing how working backwards with these elite racers allowed him to reverse engineer his primary movements teaching system designed to help anyone learn to ski parallel and start their journey to carving from day one. I've segmented today's video into sections so feel free to jump ahead to the topics that interest you the most. And a quick note, apologies for any differences in the audio quality on my end, but don't worry, Harold's insights are crystal clear, and that's what matters most. Without further ado, let's delve into the mind of the maestro himself, Harold Harb. Uh, today, your question is, yeah, I, I, I got into ski teaching in a totally different way than how most people do. Uh, you know, being a race coach and running race programs and coaching elite athletes or and evolving elite athletes from young age to the upper levels. Uh, I went into ski teaching in a totally different way with a totally different mind. I, I didn't have to go uh, through the, the steps or maneuver, maneuver steps that normal ski teaching d uses. They go, you know, you're familiar with it. I'm sure most people are with ski. That you start with a snowplow, you know, with your feet like this, and and then uh, you go through loading one ski and the other and turning one. And the emphasis is always turning the outside ski, and and uh, then trying to get the other one back in line with it so they end up parallel. You know, it's rather crude actually. Um, and I didn't go into it with that idea at all. I, I went into it with watching people ski and figuring out what was missing from what they wanted to end up skiing like. Instead of perpetrating some maneuver-based system that has four or five steps in it before you even get to parallel. And which is rather, rather crude. And it's also very, uh, debilitating for the learner because they ingrain a whole series of movement patterns that step four or five they have to unlearn or, or, or shed or get rid of to, to because a parallel turn is completely different or a good one I mean there's some bad parallel turns too but but a, a reasonably good parallel turn is absolutely different from the first three or four or five stages that are taught in traditional skiing and yeah. so when I came at it, I said, I'm not going to deal with that stuff. That, that's just slowing people down, taking a lot longer to learn. And so I started looking at it from the point of view of, interestingly enough, even a lower intermediate skier who started out with those series of those turns or, or maneuvers isn't very different from a ski racer who is trying to maneuver a slalom course or get through a slalom course. And as you know, the best skiers start first. And then as you go through the field, as you get into your 20s and 30s and 40s, you know, usually there's 60, 70 skiers in a race. You see the small mistakes that the first 10 or 15 demonstrate sometimes. You see those mistakes getting bigger and more off, happening more often as you go down into the 20s and 30s and 40s. So what is it that you see? Okay, the first thing that you notice is the release is different from, as you go deeper into the field, the release is different from the standpoint that those skiers hang on to the big toe edge side, which is the old downhill ski, and they push off of it and, and basically try to get the other ski up to an angle, which even up to into the 80s, a lot of World Cup skiers were skiing that way still. And when you see a wedge turn type skier or wedge Christie type skier, that's exactly what they're doing. Same thing. But this, the wedge learner 
isn't forced into making a turn at a p specific point or a gate that's set in the snow. This, the kids who are learning to race who haven't really accomplished a release where you don't have to stem the ski out or try to go to a big toe edge first, the ones who are proficient are clearly winning or clearly ahead, clearly, you know, knocking seconds off times that the others aren't. So when I was coaching, you would see this deterioration. Uh, you, you know, you go to hundreds of races. I've, I coached for 25 years. So I, I went maybe thousands of races and watched this process over and over and over and over. And I went, I'm not teaching my kids to do that. So what did, what did I learn from it? And what did I reverse is the question. So I, I started out with this idea of um, not allowing the big toe edge to develop. And to do that, I evolved a, a, something I, I called a touch turn drill. So you, you, at the end of your turn, you had to take the lower ski or the outside ski or the big toe edge ski and pick it up, touch the uphill boot before you were able to start a turn. Right. So in other words, you know, it's hard to, to show here. If this is my yeah, outside ski and I'm going like screen. this, yep. you had to take this ski, touch this boot, and then tip it before the big toe edge was allowed to, to come to an angle. And uh, I think that if you pull up a piece of video that you have, real yep. quick, right there where the arrow is, basically bending that leg more, picking that ski even off the ground and touching the uphill foot, the left foot in this case, with the lower boot with before you're allowed to flatten that uphill ski to get it on a new edge. And that became the touch turn drill. And that's exactly that what was missing in racers. And that's exactly what is missing in the progressions that traditional instruction creates and, and still uses to this day. So when I went at that, that that's a very rudimentary. I mean, it, no, when I introduced this, when I was on the, on the national team, the demo team, people looked at me like I was out of my mind. You know, I was like, oh, no, you can't pick up a ski. I was told you can't pick up a ski. I went, what do you mean you can't pick up a ski? Of course you can pick up a ski. Anybody can pick up a ski. It's just it depends on what you want to teach, right? And uh, so the, the movement, if you advance that photo or that, that video, if you look at the leg the way it is now, the knee is pointed uphill and it's still on edge. But when you release it and uh, bend it uh, to get it to the new angles, oh, yeah, that, this, is, this is going to show the long leg going to a short leg uh, for the, into the graphics. But uh, here's the leg, the outside leg is longer here. Um, and if I point at the yeah. outside leg where the arrow is right there, yeah, uh, that's the long leg. Now it's going to shorten here as I uh, do a pseudo picking up. When you pick up that ski or foot and you have to, you have to bend your leg to pick it up. So if you advance that right there, now it's starting to bend and it's starting to release. And if you advance it a little further, that's where it's going. Okay. The big arrow, the, the longer arrow is, is the, the, yeah, that, that leg, that foot, that's the one that's going to tip to the new angle. So if you bent, there it is, there's the movement right there. And then it's going to come closer to the other ski. And it's light when you do that. It's, it's unweighted. All right. Now, if you watch this video and, and the accompanying dialogue that goes with it, what it says there, what I said there was that to keep it light, it's called the, we call it the free foot because it's light and you can move it. So what do you do with that free foot is really crucial in connecting a series of movements in the correct order to make a parallel turn without a hint of a wedge or a hint, hint of a stem. And uh, also the thing that you notice here when, you, when this is done, uh, if you advance it a little more forward, yeah, you don't want the tails of the skis going, this is the first turn in the series, it's, it's the slowest one, but you don't want the tails of the skis going uphill or to the side, you see. So, to, and, and that is controlled by the angles with your feet and your tipping. So, 
basically this was the introduction to how I started to create PMTS and the PMTS direct parallel system. And uh, it, it started with the phantom move basically, which is what we just demonstrated here. That, that, that series of movements that you're seeing here on the screen uh, started out of uh, being what we call the phantom move, which what, the reason it's called phantom move is because it was very difficult to see it unless you exaggerated the movement and really tried to have people uh, be aware of it. Because just watching a skier go by like this, if you run this at normal speed, um, you, it's very difficult to see these movements I'm, I'm explaining here. That's why it's broken down the way it is. And uh, so that was the beginning of breaking all the pieces down. And uh, based on what we saw with skiers, uh, it, it, everything in PNTS is based on what we saw with skiers that, and instructors that we were training or coaching to become better at, with the, at their profession. And we started to change people skiing in the ski school. And it made an enormous difference in understanding and also in, in their own skiing. And uh, so that that's how, how I went at it. I didn't go at it with maneuvers or pre-planned things that, that had been used for decades. Yeah, let's, if, let's, if adre wanna, let's address balance for a second. You know, the, yeah. balance is, uh, th there are two ways to interpret balance. And uh, traditional teaching, because of the wide stance and uh, two-footedness, waiting two skis most of the time to, to try to achieve parallel, that's, that's not balance. That's stability trying to create stability for the skier, but it doesn't create a sense of dynamic moving balance where you're in balance over the ski or one ski at a time where if you lose your balance, you put the other foot down, you know, that that's a much higher level and skill level of balance. And, you know, I understand why uh, instruction, traditional instruction wasn't, uh, wasn't comfortable with dynamic balance because they didn't think people could do it now so they two-footed stability is a much uh is a, a way out if you can't teach people or if you don't know how to teach people to stand in dynamic balance and use dynamic balance constantly with movements if if you watch this series of turns in this video that you have up now there's constant dynamic balance there and and it's being controlled by an, a number of things uh, Pulling your inside foot back, the one with the arrow that I just uh, that you just demonstrated, and the, and the inside foot here that is free and moving by tipping and also being pulled back. Um, those are all methods and movements within a series of movements that create turns and angles, and so the skis can perform the way they're designed to perform, and uh, that's another piece of PMTS. Uh, I was all, when the shape skis came out, which was right about the time when I wrote my first book. Uh, all kinds of new capabilities were introduced into movements for skiers to learn, and uh, that's we addressed that immediately. We didn't wait around. We didn't keep the same teaching method. You know, here you have this wonderful tool, and you're going to teach methods that circumvent the skis. That and that's what's hap That's what happened. In fact. If you think about how ludicrous it is to teach a wedge on shape skis, you're better off teaching beginners on straight skis with a wedge than on shape skis because the shape skis, when you put them on an angle like this, they always want to converge and cross in the front. So skiers are, are actually freaking out because the skis aren't doing what they're supposed to do if you're in a wedge on a shape ski. So it this is... a a fundamental it's almost cruel it is it is very cruel and it's a fundamental it's a fundamental unawareness of the mechanics of the skis and the mechanics of the body and, and the way the body moves with skis and traditional teaching really has not even addressed that component with that they they go out and teach on a daily basis and I, i've told numerous people don't use a shape ski for teaching a wedge go back to the straight ski because you're going to have more success with a wedge 
with a straight ski. So anyways, it, yeah. it, it just shows a, a fundamental misunderstanding or not delving into the, the mechanics of, of the tools you're on even. Because your system doesn't teach a wedge. We don't. You've got the direct parallel. Yeah, we don't teach a wedge. Uh, we, we go direct parallel with shape skis and, and we, we, uh, we evolve the steps through balance we evolve the steps through the, using the the skis and m movements uh continuous movements uh we're never static um and you know people say well you're going to send them down skiing parallel and, and they and how are they going to stop if they don't have a wedge you know <laughs> and my answer to that is very simple it's just, if i if i have a someone i can teach parallel to on the beginner slope I can teach them to wedge in about five minutes, but I only teach them to use it as a maneuver to slow down in a lift line, not to use it while they're skiing. And the reverse is not true. If if you're started in a wedge and use a wedge progression, it may take you weeks, years, and months before you can get parallel because you got to unlearn all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it took ages. Yeah. To undo, because I was also um, not knee. knee. Yeah. Well, I, up the rest of it. I was using alignment with ski racers already, you know, so I had a, quite a bit of experience with what changes made what movement ab abilities available. And when I, when and I'd done this with time trials, you know, it wasn't just like my. Obviously, I was using some visual cues. And, and interpreting their movements and why they weren't as fast and laying the ski at the right angle for a certain turn. I could see that wasn't happening the way it should, but I wasn't going to go just on my visual. I, w I wanted, you know, empirical da data. So I was timing on a 40 second GS course, I was timing racers. And then I was, I, I started using these little wedges for, uh, that had angles on them. And I was at the end of the run, I would, Put these wedges in under their boots either thick side on one side or thick side on the other side depending on what i saw in their movement patterns and the angles they were not able to create and in a 40 second course i was seeing changes from one run to the next of over a second and a half and that was that's huge i mean in a 40 second course that that's a huge that that could take you years to get and yeah, I could do it in two two minutes, one lift ride. So knowing that, and then watching recreational skiers where, whose movement patterns are a lot more obvious and gross than ski racers have that you know is refining their movements for years. I started using those. Well, I started using it with the ski instructors first because they had the same problems. Uh, you know, ski instructors. In fact, when I, when I before I was an examiner for PSIA. I had to be an apprentice examiner with an examiner that we went out with to do a real exam. And in the exam, I saw some of the candidates in the exam had misalignments and I, I always carry these wedges with me. So I was with an examiner that was very open and I said, you know, do you mind if I help this one guy who couldn't, couldn't get the turn that they were supposed to make? And I inserted some wedges in and the guy immediately changed his skiing in front of the examiner's eyes and he couldn't even believe it. And he passed his course. He would not have passed it without those wedges under there. So, you know, you, my idea was my idea as a race coach is always come in and, and do something to make that skier better. You know that if you don't have that in your mind, what and investigate it to the point where you you don't give up until you find a solution. And and that's how the, the our whole. Now let me explain what what. In addition to the movements of PMTS, which is a PMTS is not just a few here tips, suggestions. It's a complete system that has steps of movement to, be, to get you to be an expert skier. There is an instructor manual and, and it teaches each step and, and it never has a wedge in it. It has people who do a wedge and we show you how to undo the wedge. We even have a a, a section in there, it's called the wedge blocker. So you, you can learn how to create skiing without the wedge completely and block that wedge from happening. But without the alignment piece, you, you can't, 
70 to 80 percent of the people who are on the hill have alignment issues enough that they have to use an adaptive movement so when i went into this i said i got to have an alignment system and i've got to have an alignment place so at winter park we started that we actually brought people in for lessons and instructors in whenever we saw someone off we brought them to the alignment center and we did the changes right there and we looked inside the boots and we looked at and measured the feet and we did a biomechanical assessment so you know what when you look at ski instruction or ski coaching ski instructors are not taught about the different kinds of feet that are available in skiing on different people they are not taught to they're not there's no access to knowing what feet people have when they show up in a lesson you don't even know what capabilities that person has with their feet because you you didn't measure it you didn't do an assessment um, then you don't know what angles their boots are and their legs are are the boots complementary and this is totally different from the feet inside the boot this is a, this is the structure of the boot changing the way you would normally stand because of the cuff angles and the bottom angles so that you don't know that and then you don't know what kind of ramp or delta you have in the binding is it flat zero does it have a lift in the heel in the binding that's three four degrees five degrees six degrees or is it negative now there there are bindings out there are negative the toes are higher than the back and you know and then you've got that issue of well someone who weighs 180 pounds is in a 110 flex boot that's a, that, that just doesn't work because that person is never going to go to the front of the boot because it collapses on them. So what do they do? They ski in the back seat. They're afraid of the front of the boot. They're afraid to get forward on the ski because the boot's not there. It collapses when they press on it. So, you know, they're, the, 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 there's so much missing in the training of instructors to become skilled in almost every system. And without that, you're not going to get results that, that people deserve, in my view. And so what we, what we do in, in our camps is people come to the alignment center and they get an assessment. We get the boots changed. We put temporary shims on to go ski with them. Then we ski with them. We see how they're doing. Then we can fine tune it, change whatever needs to be done, and within three or four days, their boots are set up, their feet are comfortable, their movements, are, awareness and understanding is developed. And that's what I call a complete system. And it's not just about the steps in what you're trying to teach them in a movement sense. It, it's the equipment, it's understanding what equipment does, it's uh, how to match that with, with their skill development. And each person has a different issue with balance or with movement, muscular capabilities all of our instructors are trained in every aspect of these things and that's why our camps have such amazing success so yeah, so, you, so balance is accessible uh, and easier yeah. to achieve and and you know how to get it and you know how to move yeah. with it without that you're not you're not comfortable with connecting a series of movements you know the the, the thing is you really have to understand how a, a movement series is developed and it's not about maneuvers it's not about a well you, your wedge christie is too wide your wedge christie narrow up your wedge christie no that's that's not what it's about it's about the movement that doesn't even create the wedge christie to start with and uh yeah we've done that, that that's what we have in our system we, we don't you don't need it now now the reverse is true though if you do need it because you can ski parallel you've got the skills to go to a wedge or a wedge Christie, if you need to make a quick direction change or you've got to stop real yeah. quick or, you know, yeah. you're getting in trouble somewhere, you can still access those movements. You know, what I tell people is this, who, who ask me, well, what if they don't get it? What if they don't get parallel right away in your first two lessons or whatever? You know, most two hour lessons that we teach for, for beginner at, at Welsh Village, for instance, and, and kids, Within two hours, they're skiing parallel. And so well, the question comes up, well, not everybody's going to be that skilled. Aren't you going to have some people who don't ski parallel in two hours? And I say, yeah, 
Some people don't, but guess what? They ski a pretty damn good wedge Christie as a result, and I never taught them the wedge Christie to start with. So if you if you're not all the way parallel, you, you're already four stages ahead of what you would get in a traditional lesson in two yeah. hours. It's almost cruel, in a sense, to introduce people to a sport of ski and just throw them in some food and say, now this is a balanced sport, but your setup is probably going to take you out of balance, so knock yourself out. And my advice to you standing on two feet with what feet a shoulder width apart is going to make it impossible for you to balance. Right. Because that's not balance. That's stability. It's like, and, a, you know, if you compare the, if you compare a table that has four legs, that's stable. I can push a table around. It's not going to fall over. But if I stand on a tightrope, I learn to balance dynamically because it's always being threatened. Your balance is always being threatened. And it, and, if your balance is being threatened, you have to learn and know how to get it, keep it, and keep it going while you're moving down the hill. And that's so different than standing on two feet. And you, you told me early on that the best ski racer usually could balance the best. Yeah, balance is Through everything. The... Yeah, moving right. with balance is everything in skiing. It's it's kind of like the fundamental holding that holds it all all the pieces together. Uh, and, you know, we teach a lot of different movements that, that, that give you the ability to stand on one ski. But fundamentally, what we're do, all we're teaching is balance. We're teaching people yeah. how to balance on ski. So they can, yeah. when you're balanced on a ski in the right place, and that means fore, aft, and laterally, you, the ski behaves differently. You, you can control it without big, forceful movements, where when you're standing on both feet, you know, the, the, the skill they like to talk about is rotary skills, which is steering mm. skills with the legs. And what you're doing is you're muscling the skis around when you're doing that. It's not using the tool correctly. Yeah. So, so given that it's a balanced sport, ideally you want optimal alignment, which equals the ability to balance right. on snow. And, and maybe some people listening to this will draw the dots and you go, Oh, maybe that's why the ski breaks away when it's icy. You know, it's hard to get that edge, right? Just Which you know, is... the, the there's a there's a wonderful thing out in in the industry now. It's boot fitting is really important. You know, boot fitting that's the talk of the day, right? Boot fitting, boot fitting. Yeah, well, boot fitting's okay. I mean, boot fitting's fine, and 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 it's a good thing. the The problem with just boot fitting is Ideally, the optimal setup is being able to use your feet and your ankles to press against the side of the boot. Now, if you have too much space in the boot, it's too big. You're going to be able to move all over the place, and you're not going to be able to have an effect on the ski. If it's too, t if you're too tight, if if the boot is too snug around your ankle, and ha and you have a, a footbed that pushes up your arch, then the foot and the ankle can't roll, and you can't use the muscles to, to roll it to roll it or tip it on an angle. So that's just as bad as being too loose. So that's why a boot fitter has to know the mechanics of what the skis need to be doing and the boots need to be doing to get you to make the movements you want or else they're not going to and you're not going to walk out of there with the right setup. So, so the hard winning formula is having an optimal boot set up and alignment so as you can maintain balance through all the stages of skiing. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've been, we've done over 20,000 assessments, biomechanical assessments that, and a biomechanical assessment, a real one re re records and measures every range of motion in the ankle laterally, fore aft, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, eversion, inversion. And based on those measurements, the, the determination is to 
set up the boot inside with the footbed so that you have movement capabilities, but not excessive movement capabilities, but enough to put forces or pressures on the side of the boots because the side of the boots, they're the direct connection to the angles that you need to create with the skis. Now, the other part of that is when we teach skiing, we teach it, teach it from the bottom up. That's why it's called primary movements teaching system. The first movement in the order of a movement is you have to understand what the bottom of your feet are doing. And most people, when I introduce that to people on the hill, they go, what? Bottom of my feet? I never even thought about the bottom of my feet. The bottom of your feet mimic exactly the angles that should be correlate to what the skis are doing. So the bottom of your skis should be doing the same thing as the bottom of your feet in the ski boots. So when you tip angles, the bottom of your feet should sense what's going on from one ski to the other and how much you're moving, which one you're moving first. And this is so important. There's, you should move one before the other. If you, use the, if you move the, the, the wrong one first, you end up in a wedge and you end up knocking your knees together and you end up crossing your tips. And uh, you lose balance and you get in trouble. And I, I think um, one of the other key points, and we'll keep playing this video, is that in your system, you teach skiers to balance on all four edges. Yeah, well, right. not, so not we at the same video, time. <laughs> <you know. laughs> not at the same time. Um, you you no. you do use the little toe edge as well as the big toe edge in our system, and but you don't you don't live on it. You 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 learn to work with it and to use it and place it where it needs to be placed. Yeah. So just walk us through here. All right. So the left foot, which is uphill right now is on the little toe edge which is on the pinky toe edge on the on that ski the the lower ski uh where the pole is in the snow where i just planted that pole is uh, on its big toe edge going to flat almost flat it's less angled than it was in the turn because i bent my knees and started to flatten my skis already but I, the key here is to flatten the lower ski first and delay the onset of the little toe edge coming through flat to the big toe edge so that the leader in the turn is always that one with the longer arrow that just appeared. That's your leader. And, and that one has to be light. And, and the reason for that is because you want to place that ski in the right relationship to the slope and to the other foot. So that what you're doing is you're releasing your CG and your, your center mass, in other words. And your center mass is somewhere around your belly button or your hips, right? And if you hold on to that big toe edge and, and flatten the uphill ski first, you're not releasing, you're not releasing your CG. You're keeping it up the hill. And that's why you get a wedge turn forever. And that's what's taught. You're taught that from the beginning, from your first lessons in traditional instruction. We don't teach that. We don't go there because it holds people back. It, it holds people back from pro pro progressing. And then they don't even know what movements to use to break those habits. Nobody's giving those, <laughs> giving them those, those movements to break the habits that they, that were taught to you that didn't work. <laughs> it really is. Like you said earlier, it's pretty cruel actually to what they put people through. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, a, it was a cruel process for me to undo everything and fun at the same time. Yeah. Cause I remember, I used to we'd be skiing and I'd be crossing my tips at high, you know, at decent speed. I remember you doing the video review just before I ate it. And you're like, wow, that's a really good commitment. <laughs> because because I was so used to going big toe, even though my setup was right, I'd be going big toe, then I'd be skiing over the top of the uphill ski and I would just be eating it um, early on. And you but know, the, the, the other thing that, that you'll see uh, if you play this video, not 
you don't have to play it now, but if people watch this video, it's on YouTube, by the way, this is, uh, you know, the yeah. introduction to the season video that I put up about a month ago or yeah. early December. If you, if you follow that video, it, it shows you that th the skis are not pushed away from you to the side. Uh, the idea here is the bending of the legs and the releasing of this, uh, the big toe edge allows you to change the edge angles with your lower body. And you'll see there's almost no change in what m position my upper body is in from the end of the turn to the beginning of the turn. And, and here's a, an edge change that's already happened. And the, the upper body didn't change from when the skis were on the uphill sides of their edges. Now they're on their downhill sides of the edges. I'm upside down to the slope right now, in fact, on that in that frame. And uh, most people never get to this point because they're never taught to do it this way. They're taught to push the skis out to the side by using steering and extension. And we don't use those things. We, we don't teach extension and we don't teach push your skis out to the side. Uh, and, and, and you see this every day on every slope on, on any, any ski area in the world, except maybe in Europe. They're a little bit more uh, controlled there. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, so if, in transition, if it's the opposite of pushing and throwing things to the side, well, you, you talk about slicing through the snow. Like what? what is it that... Well, the first thing is uh, think about uh, using muscles the way uh, you, you would in different ways of turning. When you're using an extension, you're using what is called a concentric contraction. That means you're pushing against the snow to lift your body so that it, uh, and then you can, once you've extended all the way up uh, to full range of motion, uh, you're, you're then, then you can kind of twist your skis because they, they get light. And that's how the skis get out to the side. And, you know, they don't, uh, traditional teaching doesn't say twist your skis. They say use steering or rotary movements, right, with your legs. It's the same thing. You end, you know, the weird, the weird thing is that they're teaching people to do what they already do. <laughs> I mean, think about it. just just take yeah. an image of of skiers coming down the mountain that use a wedge entry or wedge Christie, right? Why would you teach that person to extend more and refine your extension and refine your your wedge Christie? and make it closer to two-footed steering instead of a wedge steering. It, it just, it's, it's so contradictory to where you want to end up as a skier. Where what we teach relaxation to get out of the turn. It, it's, it's bending, giving in, letting go, relax. And so that you can, when you relax, your skis get lighter and your, the tension is gone in the leg so that you can use your feet to tip them over, use the smaller muscles, use the muscles that are more uh, proprioceptive and have more fine tuning capabilities. Big muscles higher up in your body, they don't have those fine tuning abilities. So you become a gross motor muscle skier and forceful skier instead of a fine tuning skier with subtle movements that save energy. So w without relaxing, it's impossible to achieve kind of position isn't it yeah th this th th people say you know the the first impression i get when i show the, and i have a lot of photos of transitions when you're in this and you look at this from the side it looks like i'm sitting down and babe and then you know the first reaction is whoa you're way in the back seat you, how do you get forward you know that's a bit i don't want to get there i don't want to be in that position and you know the other day when i was in fact the last last camp I had a, a skier, I said, you know, get down lower so you can relax the legs more, relax, get closer to the ground. And they said, yeah, but I've always felt like I was in the back seat. I said, you're not in the back seat. You're light. When your skis are light, you're not in the back seat. You can, you can move your skis when you're light and on the light on the surface. But if you're heavy and pushing, you can't. And, and this is something that is so crucial in, in the transition, like right after this frame or two right here, I bend even further so I can relax the legs and tip to the other side. Now, if, if I'm extending and pushing, it stops all of that movement. 
And well, if I stay relaxed right here, like where these arrows are demonstrating, I can just with my feet and ankles, I can roll the skis to new angles for the new turn, which is so much easier to do. Because also, if you if we haven't talked about the upper body, but if you have counteracting and you've got that upper body torque relationship to lower body, as you relax, the skis untwist themselves and they un angle themselves to go to the new angles almost by themselves. Now, if you're, if yeah. you're tense, if you're tense and, and you're, you're trying to push against the snow, you're never going to get that. And, and that's where a lot of ski teaching goes wrong. Rather than teaching relaxation, they teach forceful movements, which are extension and then trying to turn your skis with twisting rather than tipping. Yeah. So I'm hoping I'll just keep playing the video. Yeah. So the viewer can understand that during the transition phase, you used to call it the float, didn't you? Yeah, you float. I actually float. I still use that. Uh, you float right. because, you know, when you're coming off the edges and, you, and your skis are going flat, you're, it's on, and you're light at that point. So you're almost floating through the transition to the other side. And that's in, in yeah. my Expert Skier 2 book, I talk about the float and I demonstrate those. Yeah, and the, and the, and that's when the skis continue to slice. Well, it slices once you've got it to a high. Enough, you know, you're starting to tip. Yeah, and you're not really trying to dig the skis in, so you have more leeway and and no. ability to tip because they're not encumbered by pressure yet. Yeah, the pressure comes on sort of into and 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 out of the floor line, doesn't it? Yeah, I I I tell people I try to explain to people you've when you do the tipping correctly and you're using your lower body to get angles, uh, the pressure will come to you. You don't have to go looking for it. Mm. Once people start to realize, I don't need pressure. I'm not trying to hold my skis and grip above the fall line. Yeah. There's no need for it. Uh, and, you know, people say, well, how do you get speed control? Well, if, if you're in balance before you start your turn, and you start tipping, you're not in the fall line. The, the only time you accelerate is in the fall line. So you're making a round turn above the fall line, so you're not picking up speed. And and the other thing here, is, is, which is lost on almost everyone in skiing, PMTS teaches you how to get in balance on the new ski that you're gonna stand on through the whole turn before you begin the turn. Now, now take that, just take that for a moment and, and, and look at how important that is. If you, it, my left foot here, I'm already in balance, I'm balancing, I'm switching to balancing on that left foot, but I started balancing and changing to it before I even got on the new angles. So what, what happens when you do that is literally you're in balance before you begin your turn. And if you if you start a wedge, think about if you start with a wedge and, or you start with even with rotary movements where you're, you're, you know, twisting the skis into the fall line. You're not in balance. You're chasing your skis. You're chasing balance through the whole turn all the time. And if you don't get in, if you don't make the concerted effort, which we teach to get in balance on that left foot right there, not the one with the arrow, the other one, you're, you're going to be chasing balance and never be in balance through the whole turn. And then you have to slam on the edges really hard at the bottom of the turn to, to slow down. That's, that's, the balance, that's the balance foot right there. Yeah. The, up yeah. the up arrow is the unweighting foot. Yeah, that one's the... I mean, for, 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 for skiers that haven't experienced this float, this lightness through transition, one of the ways that helped me was I just used to walk up stairs sideways and I'd put my foot up to the next level of the step. And rather than push off it, I just used to keep it at the same and just bring the other foot up to it. Absolutely right. That That's exactly what we do in skiing. 
that that's exactly what I'm doing in that frame right there. But, you know, and I describe it as the lower knee, which is the one uh, to the right side, the right leg. That knee comes up and, and actually ends up higher than the outside knee as you go into the angles for that turn. If you As you develop the skis angles for that turn, that knee should come up and bend more than the other one to start the turn. Yeah. Just like you yeah. explained with the so step it's up. It's vertical. Yeah. Yeah. When I ski, I feel like a robot where it just vertical yeah. changes. Yeah. And the vertical changes so you allow you to get these angles that I'm developing right there. You, you can see my knees are downhill and they're, they're down the hill, but my skis are still going to, almost across the hill. So you're upside down on the slope and you can do that. If you have the, the timing to get out of the right, the last turn at the right moment so that you can kind of float and, and you create the float from the energy from the previous turn. And most skiers, yeah. the, most skiers don't connect turns. They, they make a turn and then they go across the hill, they traverse, and then they try to figure out how to make the next turn while they're in the traverse. And, and here you notice there's no, there are no traverses in these turns. They're, the energy is used from the previous turn to float with the relaxation to float into the angles for the next turn. And there it is right there. And, and the angles develop for that next turn. And right there, that's where the, that balance is developed right there at that point in the turn uh, before the angles even start, before the float even starts. Yeah. So the way we get to it traditionally, is the opposite of all of that. So that winning formula is okay if you want to snow plow. But then if you want to ski parallel, it's just a totally different winning formula. Well, and, you and can you can jump right over the uh, the uh, wedge winning formula, jump right past it and go right to the functional movements that you want to use for the rest of your life. Now, think about this. You've got a four or five stages in in the wedge turn wedge Christie development phase before then you unlearn everything, try to do steer kind of steering flat skis to get them to turn at the same time. While you're getting to that point, every time you go out and ski for fun or or on your own, you're ingraining the wrong movements. With our system, yep. every time you go out and ski, you're improving the right movements. <laughs> you're en yeah. enhancing your movement capabilities. So if you know what movements right from the beginning that you're trying to make, every time you ski, even on your own recreationally, you're enhancing the right movements and improving your own skiing just by skiing. Whereas the other system doesn't do that, doesn't allow it because the movements are not accurate. They're not efficient. The, the best part about being a hard ski instructor is no matter what, level of skier I'm working with, I get to work on my skiing. Exactly. Because when I was in the traditional system, skiing around with the snow plow, just wrong. Yeah, right? no, I, and then, I, I, I hear this all the time from, from instructors, yeah, especially at Welch and our own coaches. They don't mind teaching PMTS even at slow speeds to inter lower intermediates because they get yeah. to use and e evolve and enhance their own movements and their understanding of movements. When you're doing it all the time and you're using the right movements all the time, you become a better instructor <laughs> because yeah. you're enhance you're learning about your own movements and as you create them, you become aware of different things you maybe never had keyed into, and you go, "Oh, maybe I should." show my student this because this really works for me yeah. i do that all the time when i'm teaching uh, you know at the intermediate or even advanced levels i go oh i just did that movement to show somebody and i i keyed into something that i don't normally do because i don't go through the progression every day when i'm skiing and i go oh let me let me show the student this and that's why pmts is so fascinating as for the instructor, it, it keeps you motivated. It keeps you keen. It keeps you sharp because you're always looking yeah. for that next movement to teach. Absolutely. So my advice, you know, to wrap up here is 
go to my YouTube channel and this video that we referred to here and showed frames from is there and it's explained with voiceover and uh, you know each step now this is advanced you know we we can take each segment of this and have you practice it and I wasn't going to bring this up because it's going to just carry on and carry on. It's getting long, but yeah. the the beauty of this is we teach the turns in different segments. We teach we can teach from a standstill. Yeah. We can teach how to set up the top of your turn. Then yep. we can the go. Turns. Yeah. Then we can go to the bottom <laughs> of the turn and and set up and show you how to finish the turn. Yeah. And then we can show you how to stationary and statically first show you how to create the edge change or or the transition and the mm -hmm. release and we rehearse yeah. the movements that, that are needed standing still so people get a fully full experience as to how to create these different movements without a threat of going downhill and, and trying it for the first time without having to re had some form of rehearsal with a movement that that's crucial to your transition and yeah. it, it's such a it's such an evolved, really beautifully precise way of teaching. It, it it's motivating just to want to go out and teach because it's so much fun to watch people evolve for, with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can teach releasing from a standstill, you know. And, and if you uh, just pause, I disappeared. <laughs> uh, you, if you go onto my YouTube channel again, I I'll, uh, I'll reference a video I put up the two footed release, which starts from a standstill. So you don't you're not threatened by speed, inclination of the slope, whatever you you can work very precisely on each segment of, of tipping. Interesting. Uh, the tipping idea, you know, when I was on the national team, the demo the PSI demo team, uh, I was teaching tipping, they had never heard that before. They, they didn't know what it was. And the one concession after four years on the demo team was the manual that came out right after I, I left the team. They gave me, I think, two sentences in there describing <laughs> tipping. They they right. did, they didn't know how to teach it, but they allowed me to write a piece in the new manual. <laughs> and it, it's just astounding to me that you can teach skiing without teaching tipping. It's just, it's just astounding to me. It, it, it's, it's the fundamental movement. It's the one movement that... That makes everything happen and and of course if you're not teaching flexing or bending or relaxing to release you, you're not teaching tipping anyway so what's the point you know yeah. so yeah. you can see why that never evolved in their system because there was no yeah. place they could see where you use it they yeah. thought you got angles by steering your legs which doesn't get you angles at all it gives you rotation it gives you your hip following your tail of your skis around so they end up flat at the end of the turn now, you know what's going to come up when I say that. Well, how come our top skiers ski, you know, can make short turns with angles? I said, yeah, you, you've you just picked out the best athletes that will evolve on their own without your teaching system. <laughs> and and, yeah. th and this, is, this is where people, you know, they use these explanations to justify what's going on. Those people who ha have the skills and because they're good athletes and, and they have great coordination, when they go out and ski, they do not teach the same thing that they're the way they ski. They do not teach the way they ski. They, they teach the system. And yeah, they so you can go to whoever you want on YouTube, whoever you want to see on videos all over the world who ski really well. I'm not saying they don't, but they're not going to teach you the way they ski. They're going to teach you the system that their national system has evolved. Yep. So on that note, Harold, we've hit almost the, the one hour mark. <laughs> this is going to be a quick chat. Um, but look, thank you. I think that's given some really good, fine insight. Well, it's I think especially... the, next, the next time we do one, uh, we could talk more about how to identify the movements of the upper body now that we've identified transition pretty much. I mean, there are nuances in there that maybe we, you could get from my videos. 
uh, on my channel um, that if you go through them there it's all there uh, you know uh, the half a million viewer one is the straight run to tipping angles the the initial phantom move which I right. thought was so it's interesting it's the most basic most down to earth most introductory step to PMTS and it's the has the biggest views of all my videos wow so what does that tell you people are hungry for how do you create a parallel turn what are the movements and and they right. latched onto that i have three of those in a row you know one is a little bit more advanced than the other on my youtube channel but youtube channel and and those are the highest ranking uh viewership uh, the well, two-footed well, release is very popular also by for a lot of people uh, i've written made a note we'll link to those videos in the description but maybe we'll do something just on the phantom move yeah Golden sweet right because yeah. if that's the most amount of views let's just cater to what everyone's going oh wow i didn't realize it could be that easy <laughs> great well good, all right good talking with you again peter well done thanks so much harold see you on the next one bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.